Thank you. So indeed, my name is Noor Lekkerkerker and I'm working for Upinion. I'm going to give you all a little uh, insight into what we do as Upinion and how we engage with people across the world. And I'm going to give you a few examples of projects that we do, which I think might be interesting, especially also for the discussion that we and the conversation that we're going to have all together afterwards. Um, maybe as a, as, a, as a first introduction, which is always nice to tell, I find, is that I know Upinion, which is a Dutch registered uh, company, social enterprise, from my time in Lebanon. I worked uh, and lived in Lebanon for six years and worked for a local NGO there. And Upinion was a partner of my NGO and we had a really good cooperation. And so when I moved back to the Netherlands, I started working full time for Upinion. And this was a really nice way to get to know them because I was not just going on a, on a job interview. I was actually, as a local organization, already working with Upinion. And Upinion was already doing what their aim is, which is to amplify uh, people's voices in crisis situations. Um, going to start with a quote that one of the Syrian women that is participating in one of our online uh, platforms, our online communities said, which is, I participate because I felt that your platform cares about us. You have the ability to inform organizations and associations that help in reducing the injustice of the Syrian citizen and to communicate our voices to the world. Um, sorry. Because what is a huge challenge these days and a challenge that I've experienced uh, myself firsthand when working in Lebanon and trying to reach hard to reach populations, it's the challenge of connecting. Um, to reach people living in crisis situations, in displacement affected situations, in places where there are war, it's very time consuming, it's very expensive and it's complicated. And, uh, not to, and uh, it's also very risky because um, people are sometimes reached by enumerators with a notebook and a pen, uh, not only with a risk to the life of the one who's being interviewed, but also with risk to the life of those doing the interviews, because in not all places of the world it's actually allowed to just do your own research and to interview people. Uh, I wanted to show you this picture because this is actually uh, showing a, a a study that was done in countryside Bangladesh. Um, of course, it's very interesting to engage face to face with people and to, uh, to note down their experiences and their priorities. But it's also, as I said, very hard to reach these people. And I think that we can a better use this. And that's also what Upinion thinks. And therefore, Upinion has come up with the following solution. Why not reach out to people living in marginalized and crisis affected uh, communities across the world and to gather information about them that is useful for NGOs, that is useful for other actors working with these groups in the same way that these people connect with your, their family and friends and that, frankly speaking, all of us connect with our friends and family. We use WhatsApp, we use Facebook Messenger, we might use Signal. Um, and so we have also developed a, and built our own research platform um, that in which, with which we can build communities of people in all those countries that we work and how, how people can enter this platform is exactly through those social media channels that we all use in our daily life. Um, of course, this happened in a very secure and sensitive way uh, because we do know that, of course, there are all these uh, risk con risks connecting to putting all your information out there online. But what we do is we make use of social media platforms such as Facebook to reach out to people, to just normal people, you and me that happen to live in a, in a crisis situation. But then when people enter our platform and are willing to engage with us, they enter a safe uh, environment, a private mode where their answers are not visible by Facebook or any third party. Also, we don't store, for instance, the Facebook or other social media accounts of people. Uh, we just use these social media channels to get in touch with people and to stay in touch with people. So to connect with them over time. Uh, actually, as you opinion, we also just received a new ISO certification. So we have invested a lot in ensuring that our connection with people is safe and secure. Uh, we are GDPR compliant. We follow the latest uh, regulations. 
uh, on this um, in this field. And another thing that I want to discuss with you is uh, what we find very important is necessity. Um, we want to talk to people and we want to we want to capture their priorities, but we don't want to ask people about very sensitive or very painful topics more than is needed, more than is necessary. So we always uh, wonder, is the information that we're going to ask people, is this actually information that is really needed by NGOs or by local authorities to better understand these populations, or are we just harming the people by asking these questions? An example can be to ask about uh, domestic violence, like do we really need this data or is it just going to actually uh, deteriorate the situation of the person we're talking to? So, um, I'm just gonna stop this. So basically what we do as Upinion, in short, is we can reach your target community. We do this for humanitarian stakeholders and for other people working with any type of population that is, um, that is in need of certain humanitarian interventions or that they simply wanna know more about. So this can be Syrian refugees in Lebanon. This can be marginalized communities in even parts of the US. This can be uh, male sex workers in Kenya. Uh, you name it, and, and we've been there. The second step is that we connect with these people and we are in dialogue with these people. Through our safe platforms, we send out, as we call it, conversations, and uh, people give us interesting insights and stories. But then the third point here, information exchange actually comes into play, because what we do is we send people back information that might be useful for them. So we are not just a research platform, we are always trying to engage our communities and to make sure that they benefit from the information exchange. Then what we do together with our partners is advocate, lobby with, those inf with the information that we gathered with uh, policymakers, with other stakeholders. We distribute reports, uh, infographics, uh, we have meetings, whatever advocacy strategy is, is needed. And the last point on this list, the customized solutions, uh, we built our own, own software and our own application to do all those things that I just described, but um, we're always looking for new innovations. So this is not the end point. We can also uh, see, look for customized solutions and um, kind of revamp the application in case that is needed. So for, in for instance, right now in Yemen, we are uh, also ensuring that our application is um, uh, available offline and we're turning it into an education platform, which is a little bit outside the scope of what we usually do. But since the need was so high and our software was, was uh, suitable for that, we just decided to go for it. So our app is not necessarily, uh, it's always in motion. I'm just gonna show you very briefly what it might look like as a respondent. Uh, you see in the right corner, how you get questions on your phone. In this case, it's about um, the implications of the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns and uh, curfews uh, in Lebanon. So it's very easy to answer for respondents and the information is directly fed into our systems. A little picture of our team. I mean, uh, we have a small and international team. We're working from all corners of the world. Um, now I want to give you a few examples of partnerships and of projects that we have done or that we're working on right now. I thought it would be nice to talk a little bit about our partnership with Triple Eleven, as we call them, or Elf Elf Elf, I think as they're called in Belgium, the NGO coalition that works against poverty and injustice. Because uh, Upinion and Triple Eleven have been partners since 2019. And they actually share a lot of values and um, we have a lot of ideas for the, for the future. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about two of these projects that we, that we actually are still doing with them. One of them is the Refugee Protection Watch. Um, a couple of years ago, a few organizations came together in Lebanon uh, because they were all concerned about the situation of Syrian refugees in Lebanon and about the threat of premature return, the threat of the Lebanese government to start sending people back to Syria before the situation would be right. So these NGOs and Upinion started to work on a, um, on a joint program that uh, is now called the Refugee Protection Watch 
to do very structural research and advocacy around refugee protection in Lebanon. Um, and actually this project has been quite successful um, so that now it also will be duplicated in Turkey because although the Turkish context is quite different, the same concerns and overall issues when it comes to refugee protection exist in Turkey. Um, and the opinion panel was uh, very, very useful in this, in this project, since I actually can show you here, um, since, uh, in the, since the beginning of the project, we've been talking with over a thousand uh, Syrian refugees, but also Lebanese host communities. And so far we've had like 14 formal exchanges, conversations with them, but in the meantime, a lot of informal exchanges. And um, another example that I want to share with you from this project is that also we want our respondents to be sometimes present live in high level meetings. Um, the people that always respond to our conversations and that help us gather this useful information about their priorities, their, their situation, um, they're, they're always missing from the actual decision making table and from discussions with donors. So we thought we need to actually change that. And we had them participate in some, uh, in some donor meetings. And actually it was quite interesting. Um, the same question was for instance, once asked to both diplomats and to the Syrian refugees in our panel, um, both showcasing quite different priorities while the diplomats before had actually told the room that they are quite aware of the priorities of Syrian refugees. And here is another example where uh, some of our Syrian panelists could directly during a meeting voice that they, well, apparently do not feel um, heard or represented in high level meetings. Um, so just to go back, another project that we that we just started actually with Triple Eleven is uh, the Digital Space for Civic Space project. This project, uh, aims at supporting and empowering uh, civil society, civil society organizations in Turkey that have been struggling more and more to do the work that they aim to do. Uh, because there's a lot of legal restrictions and unclarity about their situation. Uh, also, of course, the political climate is, is changing, is getting tighter, there's less and less space for civil society. And so your opinion's role in this project is that uh, we are in conversation both with civil society organizations, but also with individuals uh, living in Turkey, Syrian refugees, also Turkish citizens and other nationalities living in Turkey. Um, and that also uh, we are translating the, the concerns that these uh, CSOs and these people voice to translate these into reports and into advocacy outputs. And on top of that, in this project, we are training local civil society on important issues such as data protection, data privacy, uh, data management, because uh, a lot of these organizations work with very sensitive data. For instance, they monitor human rights violations. And so it's extremely important that they get trained in that. But what we find important here is that we also use the opinion, uh, the opinion channel that we have with them to actually assess what their exact training interests are rather than just imposing capacity building trainings on them. Let's move on to another project that I want to tell you a little bit about. Um, it's a project of migration experiences in Mauritania. We did three conversations with uh, over 600 people that had moved, that were on the move from Sub-Saharan Africa mostly in the direction of Europe, but very often also destination unknown. And as I said here, it's about the one migration story of each respondent. And it's about three conversations that we send out, but countless and countless stories actually came out of this project. Um, also many victimization experiences that were shared with us. Uh, this project was together with Tilburg University and uh, the final the final report, the final, the final paper is now being uh, being drawn. Um, here in this project, what we found very important is to share back with the respondents as much as possible information about uh, services uh, and NGOs on the way that could potentially help these people, because that was a question that was often 
uh, asked to us in those conversations. Um, another project that I think would be nice to talk talk with you about because it's it's quite recent and I think very relevant, of course, for all of us is that we uh, looked into vaccine has uh, sorry willingness in the Sahel region. So we looked at Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, and uh, we did this together with the crisis analytics team of Mercy Corps, who wanted to better understand the drivers of vaccine hesitancy. Uh, however. After having done a conversation with uh, over 1,800 respondents across these three countries, um, actually, I changed the title to vaccine willingness because one of the main outcomes were that a lot of the people that we spoke with were not against uh, taking a COVID-19 vaccine if it were uh, would become available to them. Um, a lot of them uh, just did not have access to the vaccine, but were not necessarily against it. I mean, this and many other interesting findings, uh, of course, you can also read in the report that we published after this, which I can also share with you uh, later through email. But I would just want to say one more thing about this project, because I wrote down here the local opinionators. And I just want to add that, uh, of course, uh, when we talk about our, our technology, a lot of people will always ask us, but what about access to the internet or access to smartphones? Do people have access to internet everywhere? And of course, the answer is no. Of course, access to internet is still a problem in many of the places that we work in. Of course, not every individual has their own smartphone all over the world. Um, so when we work in a context where it's hard to reach the target population, we also work with local opinionators, people that are very actively uh, and pro yeah, very proactively engaging in our platforms are trained uh, as opinionators. So they're trained to also do outreach in their own communities um, in a structured way in order to reach more, um, to reach more people. And uh, well, this has really helped us for instance, in this region. We also work a lot with local uh, CSOs, uh, civil society organizations, and NGOs to help us uh, increase our outreach. Um, I want to I wanna end with this. I already mentioned that it's very important for us that we're not only extracting data from people, but that we also give back something interesting because the people that we talk to are the direct, they are directly experiencing the negative consequences of whatever crisis situation it is that we're investigating. And so I just wanna give you a few examples of things we did. And then actually I would love for you all to think about uh, more ideas in this regard. Um, we did a project in Kenya with male sex workers um, and people who would get actually vouchers. This was made possible by local organizations that they could um, get uh, goods for items, for instance, condoms in this case, and they could pick them up at the location close to their, their house. Uh, another thing that we often share with the respondents is information uh, or just awareness messages. Uh, we did a big project on COVID-19 perceptions in Yemen with tens of thousands of people and uh, well, we made it uh, our, our aim to counter some of the Fake, the clearly fake news messages uh, that we received uh, from people that we understood were circulating and uh, countered that with, um, with reliable sources. Of course, the issue of fake news is a, is a tricky one. It's not always that easy, but in this case, um, yeah, we, we countered what we felt was definitely uh, dangerous to be in circulation. Um, the project that I told you about that we are doing with Triple uh, Eleven on uh, the, the situation of civil society in Turkey, what we do there is, for instance, share um, good legal resources available in Turkish and also in other languages that the civil society organizations can, can benefit from, because one of the main problems there is that um, a lot of organizations don't even know which resources to access and how to use them. Also, a little bit among, along these lines are uh, the freely available IT courses, but there could also be courses in any other field that we share, for instance, with our community in Lebanon. Um, as you all know, there are a lot of uh, freely available online courses uh, these days, but 
a lot of people are not aware of that. And it's uh, always good if someone makes a pre-selection of good courses uh, in the language of the, of the respondents. Um, and then, yeah, we also ha always have the respondents evaluate the conversations with us and uh, let us know whether the topics that we discuss are actually relevant to them or whether we should change course and, uh, and start talking about something else. So in summary, before I, uh, I, I stop talking, um, what do we have to offer as opinion and how did we, uh, did we start growing and how did we feel there was an interest in a market in, for what we did is that we aim to reach people that are a little bit beyond the usual outreach of, for instance, NGOs. Like very often NGOs work and do research on among their own beneficiaries or the communities they always work in. And by doing online outreach, the reach clearly gets much bigger. And in a way, yeah, you tap into a new group of people. Um, of course, people can also respond from the comfort of their own house, their own device. And so this also makes uh, for a much faster outreach. Um, you can speak to the same people over time because once they're in our system, uh, just by unique uh, user code, not by their Facebook account, um, it's much easier to reach out to them and it makes many uh, researchers much more interesting if you can follow up with people rather than do a one-off thing. Uh, I mean, yeah, the future is digital. I mean, let's face it, uh, when I was living in Lebanon, I saw how little use was made of technology for people living in displacement situations or in crisis situations. And that is not, uh, I don't think that's that's sustainable at all because also all over the world we're moving towards a more digital world uh, not to say that this is absolutely uh, replacing traditional forms of research but it is a complementary method um, as i said i just want to end with a question also for you as a bit of food for thought like how do you think that our panels of respondents or our community can benefit from the exchanges with us uh, do you have any uh, good ideas for that then maybe you can uh, let me know later. Um, I will share with you, of course, also uh, the presentation and some interesting resources. But for now, you can reach me here for any questions. So thanks for your attention. And I'm uh, handing back to you, Philippine or to Lynn. Thank you, Noor, and thank you for those really interesting inputs. I think this will be um, food for thought for a lot of projects and also for um, further discussion. I suggest that we move on now to Lynn, who's going to um, tackle the topic in an other way. And then um, we can, of course, um, discuss around it. I see that some questions are coming through in the chat. Don't hesitate to ask all of your questions and then we will um, open a um, live exchange. Um, the floor is yours, Lynn. Thank you both. One of the benefits of uh, taking part in these type of digital sessions is to learn more about other initiatives. So really interesting note. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lynn. Um, I'm a member of Citizen Lab, and uh, that's a Belgian company founded in 2016 with the aim to strengthen local democracies. And what do we do exactly? We partner up with uh, mostly local governments uh, to allow uh, for, um, for them to open a dialogue with their citizens. So to um, allow for online participation. Um, I'm gonna share with you, um, I'm gonna try to keep it in, in 10 minutes, um, an introduction of what we do exactly and why we do it. Um, and then some examples to uh, inspire you, hopefully on, on this topic of digital participation. Um, but let's keep enough time as well for, for questions afterwards. Um, as mentioned, you can always post them already in uh, the Q&A. Um, talking about Citizen Labs, mission, uh, why we do what we do. Our, our goal is really to um, make um, digital participation, um, first of all, more inclusive. Um, what we see 
uh, most of the times that um, local governments or organizations are always talking to the same people, um, a handful of people, um, and it's it's really for them important to get a better understanding of, okay, what does our community look like and, and, and what um, to, to do a temperature check uh, with a wider community. And that's where inclusion comes in. Um, Oftentimes, uh, there is already offline participation, um, and I'm not going to use a buzzword, but um, hybrid participation is the way to go in the sense that you're um, combining offline and online uh, to reach more uh, people and a more diverse group of people. Some um, people will always prefer to meet face-to-face. -face. Other people will uh, rather be able to engage um, via the online channels. I'm thinking of young people or um, households with a double income, um, busy ones uh, that might not have the time to literally go to workshops uh, and physical events and then uh, prefer to um, to give their opinion and share their ideas via um, the online channels. So that's when we talk about inclusion responsiveness is more about making sure that you continue um, or you keep the communication line open, um, that when you start a participation project with your community, that you make sure everyone is uh, kept in the loop um, and that you uh, update everyone regularly including at the end of the project, um, it's clear, okay, this is the outcome. This is um, you as a citizen, you've invested your time, your energy um, into this. You have um, shared your ideas. And now it's important as well to know, okay, this is what came out of, um, of this entire process that we went through together. Um, so transparency is, um, is a key word here. And uh, the third element, participation, making participation more participatory. It may sound a bit funny. It's uh, it's really about making sure that you get those higher engagement numbers, uh, what we talked about uh, in the beginning as well, right? Um, not just talking to the, the same people, but really um, getting the pulse of, of your community. Um, for all of this, um, every single... Um, part of our mission it's actually based on one of the un sustainability uh, sustainable development goals um so this this is our uh, framework, let's say, and so we have been recognized for this in the past. Um, we are, for example, a B Corporation for those who don't know what that means. That's uh, literally a certificate that um, businesses um, who put profits, uh, sorry, who put purpose over profits um, will will get. It's a, it's a, a label that has been shared with uh, 5,000 companies around the world now, and we're very proud to be to be one of them. Um, so B Corp, check it out. Um, it's um, it means uh, it means a lot to us uh, that we can, of course, run our business day to day, but while doing so, we also make this world a better place. Um, and then. Um, what you uh, can see on the right also the share the slides will be shared so do click through um to the impact report that's how we evaluate ourselves on this mission that we have to make sure that uh, every year we see okay how have we been doing in terms of responsiveness inclusion and participation and how can we do better um next time um that's that was why we're doing it uh to give you a very clear understanding of what it is that we offer it's a digital platform, um, a centralized place where, uh, on the one hand, as an organization, you can go and um, um, open that dialogue with your um, with your members, as in local governments, with your citizens. Um, but it's also the place in the back office then where you uh, are going to um, collaborate as a team uh, to set up projects, to moderate debates, um, to open uh, communication channels. And then um, based on the input that you get, are able to analyze everything. We, we uh, provide you with reporting and visualizations of, of the, the data that comes out of it so that you can make better decisions um, as, a, as an organization. Um, this one is showing you, um, for people who are in the participation field, it might be... Um, uh, you might recognize it. That's what we call the participation letter. 
uh, literally it shows you how you can climb step by step upwards, um, uh, how you can um, make every single project more and more participatory, uh, starting on the left side. That's, of course, one way uh, communication. Um, you literally inform uh, the citizen about uh, a certain project, whereas if you look on uh, the uh, extreme right side of your uh, slide and you see uh, a very high level of participation where citizens have a say in the matter where they decide on budgeting um, and um, come up with proposals themselves. Um, so we help guide organizations and local governments in moving up that ladder um, by providing all the participation methods that you see on the on the bottom of your slides. Um, that is, in a nutshell, uh, what we do. Uh, and um, I would like to maybe to also because of time um, constraints, I would prefer to focus on one example, I'm gonna um, focus on this one uh, please know that there are others in this slide as well for you to uh to um explore um Shili is um the one i'm going to focus on and there's also a link underneath uh you'll find out that's um, an article by people powered where they explain the entire case so good if you want to read through it uh, on your own time as well um, but more interestingly um there is also uh, the first uh, paragraph of that article also contains plenty of more uh, examples from China, from Kyrgyzstan, Argentina. So other um, countries and cases of digital participation where citizen-led was not involved, but that could help you as well, could inspire you when you're uh, working on, on participation projects. So looking at this one, um, this was about um involving youngsters involving young uh, leaders uh, of tomorrow um in the agenda setting um and the project was called creamos um and it was uh, established or organized by the national youth institute of chile so that's a uh, inhof and i'm just gonna click through to um uh, um to the platform to show you what uh, what that looks like um, also, you'll see, you can click through uh, to all the platforms in, in the other examples that I shared as well, so that you can have a look. This is what you will see um, if you, you visit uh, a participation platform like the one, uh, like this Creamos, and then you see all the, the, the projects that are running. You can see the, the participation, um, um, you see what's, what's going on. I'm just going to uh, click on the main, the central topic. Um, to give you an understanding of, of how this is built, how participation platform is built um, with, first of all, an introduction for everyone to understand, okay, what's the main purpose here? Um, introducing um, the target audience, the requirements, how the project will be run. Um, you can see quick facts as well about uh, participation numbers. And then, um, an, an overview of the timeline, very important one, uh, talking about transparency um, and, and having um, a clear understanding of where you're going to end. Now we're in the final phase of implementation that's running till mid-December, uh, but interesting, for example, to uh, look at how it started, uh, the first ideas that came about very broad um, ideation phase, uh, anything was welcome. Um, and um, yeah, I'm just gonna click on this one here by Benjamin. Um, for example, his idea of, I think if my Spanish is good enough, um, to have more native uh, trees planted. Um, with then, for example, he even shared a video, um, comments from other people. He got uh, 113 votes and then had an um, an approval from um, uh, the organization that he can go through the next stage. I see that we're running out of time, so I'm just going to um, maybe 
give you one final idea of how the process went. There was a, a very big group of people that uh, were, were, everyone was allowed to share ideas. Then you had some selection criteria to make sure that uh, they ended up with, uh, let's say, a bundle. It was 450 ideas. Those people, those young leaders um, could then follow training and get uh, an understanding of how you run a project. And then uh, they were allowed to post their final projects um, with uh, the final tweaks um, on this platform, people could vote and then 30 projects were um, were selected after all uh, for a, a total budget of uh, of two um, million 